Good morning and welcome. Welcome to worship here at First United Methodist Equipment. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good response. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. good. I love to hear that response uh, come echoing back. We've got a number of announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, we want to welcome all the visitors uh, to First United Methodist Church. Uh, and we encourage everybody to sign the red book and pass it toward the center uh, so the uh, uh, ushers can pick that up during the offering time. Wednesday night live, 5.15 p.m., youth meal and Bible study. At 6 p.m., uh, adult Bible study will be in the celebration room with Pastor Harper. If you haven't had a chance to attend one of those, uh, please come. We had 35 people or so there last Wednesday night, and it was an exciting time, and it's a great opportunity to grow in Christ and learn the, the power of of uh, worshiping. For uh, future planning, if you'd like to participate on a me in a meal team to provide meals for adult attendees on Wednesday night before Bible study, please contact the church office. In the past, we've kind of gone to Sunday schools with that. We're putting teams together for um, serving the meal with that. So if you'd like to be an active volunteer, we encourage that. And, would hope that uh, you would call Martha in the office and she'll get you on a team. Please uh, be aware of upcoming dates in February. Saturday, February 10th at 5 p.m., the youth will host their annual Valentine dinner and all are welcome. <clears throat> There's no charge for the dinner, but donations will be accepted. Proceeds will benefit the youth ministry and their travel and the trips that they, they take. Uh, Sunday, February 11th, after the 11 a.m. service, there will be a potluck lunch in Joy Hall, and food will be accepted in Joy Hall Kitchen before the 11 a.m. service. Plans are underway for celebration of the Lenten lunches and uh, devotions and Holy Week. If you'd like to serve on a meal team, please call the church office. Plenty of opportunities to volunteer, and we appreciate everybody's assistance in that. I wanted to take a couple of minutes this morning and visit about the First United Methodist Church Endowment Fund. We have a foundation in the church. Some of you may not be aware of that, but uh, over the years, uh, we've had many people leave estates and major gifts and occasionally memorial funds to build this fund. We have three different funds in that. We have the Endowment Diversified Fund, which is there to bent the earnings are there to benefit the church. Uh, I'm pleased uh, we have a total of $468,545.51 in that fund, of which about 125000 is accumulated earnings in the fund. So that can go back into supporting 
projects or benefits or things that are not in the regular church budget. There's a separate endowment board uh, that's appointed uh, through the nominations committee each year. Would members of the um, foundation please stand and so you can uh, identify someone that uh, is a member of the... They, um, that, that you can talk to them with any questions you might have about the foundation for sure. The second fund is the uh, Ed and Grace Tree Endowment Fund. Ed and Grace were former members of this church. Uh, they funded uh, a, a nice scholarship. Originally it was for Eagle Scouts, but now we can be using that for scholarship funds since we no longer have a scout troop uh, with the church. Or if there are Eagle Scout members that were a member of that troop and, and are still, uh, they're eligible for scholarships in that as well. The third fund is uh, Bill and Beth Robinson Endowment for Sanctuary Enhancement. And at our last meeting uh, last week, uh, we'll be getting some new uh, paramounts for the, for the front of the church and uh, Occasionally, uh, it's used to, to benefit things in the sanctuary with it. Totally, uh, in the fund, there, the three funds together, there's $554,725.29 as of January 1st. It's been a, a great opportunity to watch that grow. To give you an idea, in um, 2013, we had $76,000 in that fund. So thanks to the generosity and the benefit of, of many people and through their estate plans and others, uh, that fund has been able to grow. If you have any questions, I or any member of the foundation board would be happy to answer that. Uh, Tuesday morning, there will be a breakfast on honoring Wood County veterans and their spouses this uh, Tuesday, February 6th, 8, to 9, 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. in Joy Hall. That's a great opportunity, and if you're a veteran uh, or a spouse of a veteran, you're welcome to attend. It's a great uh, fellowship time, and you can hear some great war stories about the uh, various experiences people have. Everyone is uh, welcome for that. Trustees will meet at 1.30 this afternoon uh, in the annex. Is that correct? We will meet in the annex. So uh, look forward to uh, that meeting. And finally, there will be a coffee with the pastors group meeting scheduled over the next few months in a home near you. If you'd like to attend that or uh, host one of those, uh, feel free to volunteer with the church office and those will be set up uh, occasionally. Are there any other announcements that I've missed? I've only taken half of his sermon time this morning, so uh, we appreciate your attendance. If not, let's stand and greet someone you don't know.
Okay, church, as we come back together, I'd like to invite you to remain standing for our opening hymn, Holy, 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 we'll sing all verses. Please remain standing and join me for the historic affirmation of faith known as the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Church, now we enter into our time of community prayer. This is an opportunity for us to lift up uh, the prayers of the community. What's going on in the life of the church? What should we know about? How can we be in prayer with you? 
And so now I would like to offer some space for us to lift up prayer requests together as a community. Hi. Oh, boy. Um, I, I just want to pray for the whole state of California. We're from there. We have a whole lot of family there. And they are just getting, like, deluged in rain. And a lot of people are being displaced. And so, yeah, just pray for California in all sorts of ways. <laughs> Thank you. What else? Some good-looking acolytes this morning. Prayers for the nation and Israel. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Prayer for Stephen Rhodes, who's uh, remaining in ICU with lung issues. Yeah. What else? Let's pray together. Uh, Father God, we do come to your holy space this morning to worship you, to glorify you, to, to spend time with you. Um, but as we do that, Lord, we, we bring a lot of our own stuff into the space with us. And so we lift up the prayer requests that have been named out loud in addition to the ones that we've kept for ourselves. We ask, Lord, that you would reign in those things so that we may be freed to worship you, unencumbered, undistracted, trusting that you are the God of the universe and whatever fears or anxieties or concerns that we have that you can handle. And so we lay them down at your feet today. And all these things we pray in the name of Lord Jesus who taught us to pray this way, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Here we go. Oh, that was very good, Cedar. Very, very good. You were first. Absolutely. You're first. All right. So here's a kind of a strange question, and I think I know the answer to it. But how many of you have a phone? You wish. Okay. All right. You have one. I could imagine you with a phone, Poppy. I'm sure all your friends would love it. So you know, I'm, 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 I ask that because it's amazing to me how many kids we see with phones. That's a whole different story. But the point is, how many of you guys have ever played with your parents' phone? Okay, right, right, right. Probably all like, <laughs> let me list. Oh, you play with Miss Jennifer's. That's why there's weird stuff on my YouTube. Okay, um. So, so here's the deal. If, if I take a phone, um, the other night I was helping Carly with putting her chickens away. Right? And then we forget they exist. And then when we come home at like 10 o'clock at night, it's like, oh, we got to put them away. So we go outside in the pitch dark and we try to chase chickens around. 
It's not the most funniest thing to look at, but um, it, it's really weird. But we, we have a problem because it's dark. We need flashlights. But a lot of times when we go in the house, I need a flashlight. We can never find a flashlight. We can find them all the time when we don't need them. But when we need them, we can't find them. So what is the next thing we do as people with self? Okay, see, you already know. The next thing we do is we pull our phones out, right? And so we turn. There's a battery on this. So we turn the light on right now. If we turn all the lights off in here and covered all the windows, it would be pitch dark in here. Could, could we walk around in pitch darkness with no lights? No. I, mean, I guess we could, but then we would run into people and we would hurt ourselves. And so, no, we can't do that. So we have our light on, right? So we use our light, and if I turn my light on, I could walk in the dark anywhere. Now, here's the question, though. Um, the reality is, is the world we live in is, is dark. Your dress is black. Like the dark, right? So, so here's the, the world is, is, is dark because of sin, and, and sometimes it's hard for us to kind of walk through. And so what we have is we have someone inside of us, so we can have a relationship with somebody named Jesus who gives us a light inside of us. And so with that light, we can walk through and learn how to get through the world we live in. So it's only when I have the light that I can actually see where I'm going. But let me ask you this. If I take this phone with a light on, okay, and if I decide that the next best thing to do is to take a picture of you, what happens to the light? Okay, okay, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. What if I take a, a picture of me? It's off. It's off. What? Why did it go off? I didn't turn it off. When we start focusing... <laughs> That's the easy answer, no, because when we start focusing on others and start saying, oh, they hurt my feelings and they are mean to me, when we start focusing on that, our light of Jesus goes away. Or when we start looking at ourselves, look how good I look, ooh, right? the light goes off. And so we want to encourage you guys as we kind of move into children's church, you're right, as we go to children's church, we've got to learn how we can shine our light for others to see and sometimes that means we don't look at ourselves we look at others and see how we can shine that light to them as we learn who jesus is cool so we're gonna go to children's church if you guys want to so before we go would you pray with me he did make the world and he made you god so um let's pray real quick <laughs> easiest answer in church god okay let's pray real fast Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me your light. Would you help me to learn how to show that light to others in my world? We love you and thank you. In your name, amen. I will follow out. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, children. As we prepare for our time of offering, um, I'm reminded uh, during Daryl's uh, announcements uh, that if you want to give to a specific area of the church, whether that's the endowment or your tithe or um, the, the roses that are out front, uh, if there's something you want to give specifically to, just a reminder to let us know. Uh, so that we can make sure that we send the money uh, where you want it to go. Uh, if not, it goes into operating, which is great. Uh, pastors love people just giving to operating. Um, but it is a good reminder to us uh, that to give us a little indication of where you would like uh, your money to go. And as we transition into this time, I just want to encourage you that giving is an act of worship. So let's continue to worship God during this time of offering.
Our next sermon is, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed? We'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. Will you worship with us? Our scripture reading for today comes from Romans 5, 8 and 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. First Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is a word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. My name is Reverend Thomas Harper, and today we begin a brand new sermon series all about basic Christian orthodoxy. Over the next five weeks, we're going to talk about what have Christians historically believed? What do we believe about the nature of God? What do we believe about the nature of us? How God is redeeming this world back to himself, and what we believe will be the end of this story. This morning, we're going to kick off this sermon series by talking about a God that would choose to bleed and suffer for our behalf in order to reconcile creation back to creator. Let's pray. Father God, open us up. Open us up that we might receive a word from you today. Holy Spirit, I ask now that you would speak through me, or if need be, in spite of me, that we would know you more. And as we come to know more and more about who you are, would that shine light on who we are as your people? All these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So whenever we're talking about Christianity or Christian beliefs, a good place to start is with Jesus Christ. 
In fact, Jesus is the most appropriate place for us to start because everything that is unique about the Christian faith is rooted and founded in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the lens by which we know and understand God. Have you ever thought to yourself, I'm going to sit down and just read through the entire scripture of the Bible. I'm going to start in Genesis and just go to the end of Revelation. Now, while I do think Christians should read the Bible in its entirety, at least once in your life, if you are new to scripture, I actually don't recommend you start with Genesis. I recommend that first you start with the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament. And that's not because the stuff that came before it doesn't matter. It's because you need to know and understand who Jesus Christ is and what he came here to do in order to understand the story that God is telling in the Old Testament. Have you ever read the Old Testament? It can be hard reading sometimes. There can be some confusing things in there at times. The felon, what is that? So much so that you might be tempted in your reading of this Old Testament to think that the Old Testament God and the New Testament God sound like two different gods. God of wrath and vengeance and anger. This is a God of mercy, grace, and forgiveness. This is actually an early second century heresy in the church known as Marcionism. This belief that the Old Testament God was an evil God and the New Testament God came to conquer the old. But as I said, that's a heresy. It's not true. God is the same God throughout all of the Bible. But that's why we need to read all of the Bible through the lens and understanding of the work of Jesus Christ. Helping us understand the story that God is telling and what the Old Testament is leading up to. Here's how the story of God as told through Christianity goes. In the beginning... God created everything and declared that it was all very good. And then God created humanity and breathed into us the Shema, the breath of God. This God breath made us a little different than the rest of God's creation. Allowing us to either align our hearts and wills with God or to reject and run away. And hide from God. Our ancient ancestors chose to do the latter. And we'll talk a lot more about that next week when we talk about what we've come to call the fall. But for our purposes this morning, it's enough to say that what we did when we rejected God created a separation between us and God created more than one will being enacted on creation. And that separation caused God to to change the plan in order to reconcile us back to him again. This reconciliation is twofold. It's for humanity, bringing us back in right relationship with God. But it's also for all of creation, because sin affects everything, and sin has spread throughout creation, throughout the generations, and God is working to redeem all that back to what he first declared in the beginning, to be good again. In order to do that, God makes a covenant with Abraham. Says Abraham, I am going to make my covenant with you. I'm going to make you a great nation, and all the world will come to be blessed 
by you. And Abraham believed, and his faith was counted to him as righteousness. After that, the Old Testament can be summarized fairly poorly like this. God reaching out to his people. His people following God's rules for a while, but eventually stumbling, rejecting, and separating from God. So then God sends a prophet to get the people back on track again, and they follow God for a little while before again falling away and stumbling. And then God says, enough. I will come. I will dwell among you. I will do this so that you can see my face and know what a human who loves perfectly looks like. That was Jesus. The God who became human. The infinite that for a time became finite and walked among us. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, became the new sacrifice for our sins. And by his wounds, we were healed. And because of his resurrection, we will have new life. That's the story of who God is and a little bit of who we are. And that's a story that most of us have heard probably in various forms before. And that's not a bad thing per se. But I think over time we start to get a little desensitized to that story especially compared to what contemporaries of Jesus' time would have heard in the telling. For a God to choose to suffer, to bleed, to die for humanity would have been very scandalous in the Greco-Roman world. Greek gods at the times were known for either not really caring that much about people on earth or being obsessed with being worshipped and venerated by them. So for a god to come down off of his throne and walk among us, broken, beaten, unjust world, Most people wouldn't have taken that story all that serious. Even for God's chosen people, the Jews see God at this time as something wholly other, as unapproachable, as you cannot look on the face of God and live. Many Jews today still won't say the name of God, Yahweh, out loud. That is the context of what's going on in the world when God decides to enter into the world. We had been separated from God. And because of that separation, we could not look upon God's face. We could not speak God's name. And then God came to us to give us a face to see and a name to call in Jesus Christ. And the fact that God would come to us as a helpless little child. Well, that would have been scandalous for both the Jews and the Greeks. So much so that when God actually showed up, most of us missed it. But he did. And when he did, he altered the trajectory of humanity forever. God in Jesus Christ 
taught us through his life how to live in right relationship with God and with one another. And in his death and resurrection, bridged the inconceivable gap between us and him that sin had created. I think how God chose to come to us says an awful lot about why God came and his plan for coming. I mean, think about it. He came as a baby. Not some conquering warrior king, right? So that tells us that God didn't come to conquer and subdue the world. He came to redeem it. And to come as a helpless human baby. Those of you that have had human babies, you know how helpless a human baby is. Horses are walking within like 12 hours. It takes our kids 13 years, months. <laughs> Feels like years sometimes. That's how the God of the universe came to us, friends. Having to rely on his creation just to survive. I'm going to rely on a teenage girl to take care of him, keep him warm, and feed him. I think that tells us something profound about the heart of God. That God sees fit to partner with his creation to bring about this restoration. This is basic Christian orthodoxy. But man, let us hear this story with fresh ears this morning. Jesus' life paved the way for us to live our life right again. He is our teacher and example of what it means to live rightly with God and each other. And his death and subsequent resurrection accomplished something that w has transformed the universe forever. Anselm of Canterbury is an 11th century theologian that has had great influence on Western theological thought. And is perhaps most known for his substitutionary atonement. This, this theory that he called the scandal of the cross. In it describing what happened, what took place when Jesus went to the cross and why it was necessary for it to happen that way. Now you may not know this, but there is no orthodox position on the atonement. Meaning, there's no official Christian belief of what took place when Jesus died on the cross. It's just theories. And the one that is probably the most prominent to us is Anselm's substitutionary atonement. The idea that on the cross, Christ died and paid for our sins in our place. Now, Anselm wrote a huge book the treatise on the incarnation, and it's about this thick. And Mark, I had to read every single word of it in seminary. So I'm going to try to summarize it in one phrase. But I would encourage you, if you have the interest and the time, you should read it. It is a fascinating ontological argument for the atonement and why it happened but I'll try to poorly summarize it this way. The cross happened the way that it did. And Jesus had to have been both God and human. Because only a human can actually suffer on the cross. But only a God could be worthy enough to pay for the totality of the existence of 
of our sin. That is the difference between Christianity and all other religions. All other religions are humanity's attempts to just follow God's rules. To, to, to reach up and try to ascend to God. But Christianity is God reaching down to us and bringing us to him. It is scandalous that a God would choose to bleed for us. That's what this table is about. This is a promise to us that what was lost shall be restored again. What was broken has been mended in Christ. And everything we see that is not a part of the kingdom will one day be no more. Because of Jesus, we will see God's face. We will feel the holes in his hands and in his body. One day we will fully know and look upon the face of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that when there is no way, you make a way. That when we run, when we play hide and seek from you, you come and find us and bring us back home again. Thank you, God, that you would come just inconceivable different distance to be united with us again. In your name we pray. Amen. So we prepare for communion. I want to remind you that our rail offering will go to the Northeast Texas Child Advocacy Center. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins to each other. I invite you in this moment to just lift up your sins silently to the Lord. Hear the good news. Jesus died for us while we were sinners, while we were running, while we were broken. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life. And when we fell away, you came after us. And when we messed up, you forgave us. And when we ran from you, you showed up in person to redeem us. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, and broke the bread, 
and said, take, eat, this is my body that has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, Christ took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. That has been shed and poured out for you. Do it as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until that day when you come in final victory and you call all things back to you again. And we feast together at that heavenly table. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite those who are helping to serve to come forward.
Church, as we prepare for our closing hymn, I just want to remind you uh, that you don't have to run out of here. Um, If you want somebody to pray with or if you want to talk about where you are in your faith, I'd love to talk to you. And I'd love to meet you there in the back as well. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Rock of Ages, verses 1 and 2. Church, next week we're going to talk about the state of us and about the serpent's lie and how that lie manifests itself today. But there's a tendency sometimes when we talk about the cross to focus too much on our sin. The story is really more about who God is. And the story that the cross tells us is that God is reaching out and pursuing us, inviting us to come back home. Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you. Not just the entire world, but especially you. Receive that. And then church, go out into this world and share that with a world that so desperately longs for it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people, set it together.